Assalamu alaikum and welcome to tonight's live show on Imam Hussein TV. Condolences to all our global viewers, all our viewers all throughout the world. Tonight, we'll be looking at the life of Imam Hadi al Islam, also known as Imam Ali Naqi al Islam, the 10th Holy Imam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as we all know, has special names. Of one of his divine names, he is referred to as Al Hadi. And so, this Imam is the embodiment, the manifestation of Al-Hadi, as it were. One who shows and who brings about guidance. He is also known as one who is Al-Naqi, as I mentioned previously, right in the introduction. And that means the one who is pure. We recall the Samara bombings, and I have also visit, visited Samara previously on my Ziyarat trips, and Alhamdulillah, I have been graced with visiting Karbala, Najaf and Samara previously before and Qadbain. But why is it that this holy Imam, as one of the latter Imams, has been forgotten perhaps throughout the world? Let's look at his life, his teachings, his childhood, his Ziyarat and more. With me tonight, I have the pleasure to have once again with me Dr. Sayyid Amar Naqshwani. Assalamu alaikum Dr. Wa alaikum Sayyid Amar Naqshwani. Wa alaikum Indeed, it's a pleasure to have you again once again. Thank you. Thank you and condolences to everybody. Yes, yeah. condolences to all our viewers on the Shahadat of uh, the 10th Holy Imam. Um, Sayyidina, many mosques unfortunately were empty last night. Um, if we take notes, uh, Many people watched the football match, Manchester United versus Arsenal. Um, and perhaps we don't show the same level of enthusiasm, love, energy, as it were, to go to the mosque. Uh, by that, I, what I mean is if we commemorate the Shahada of Amir al Mu'minin alayhi salam mm. and Muhammad al Majalis, but sometimes the latter Imams, namely Imam Hadi al Islam, is perhaps forgotten. Are we selective in terms of choosing what is a big night and what, not, what is not a big night? It's almost like media advertising that is influencing, influencing us. I think there is a, a certain element of truth to what you're saying. There are certain people who have uh, sadly uh, put the imams into categories mm. of big nights and small nights. So you'll see even... Somebody like Abel Fadl al-Abbas, who's not That's seen right. as one of the 12 Imams, you'll see that there are many who may attend his uh, wilada, for example. Yeah. Well, they will not necessarily be there in the wilada of Imam al-Hadi, alayhi salam. So there is that element. There is another element, I think, where there were a number of mosques closed last night. In London, the youth worked hard to try and ensure that there was a program. You find, for example, the Haider Islamic Center, Stanmore Mosque, they had programs. But there were a few mosques which I think are worth millions, um, which were closed. Um, I find it unbelievable yeah. that a mosque can be open for a political event, for example, mm. such as um, a social event, for example, such as, you know, come visit my mosque day. But the mosques are not necessarily open when it's the night to commemorate the very people who laid the foundations for us. No doubt. No doubt. Um, so it's a shame that we see that there are mosques which did not cater for the communities last night. Then you have a third category of people who did not have a clue that it was a shahada yeah, last yeah, night. Sure. I would say totally oblivious. there are parts of the Muslim world, and I'm talking parts of the Shi'i world, who last night would not have a clue. They know Muharram. You know, mm. they see that everybody's wearing black and you have to go to the Majalis and the Majalis may be, you know, full of passion. But I would say that there are parts of the, of the world where 
people did not know that Imam al-Hadi alayhi salam passed away. They did not bother to uh, look at his life no. or his biography. And sometimes the onus is on the lecturers as well Quite to true. try and uh, deliver more of an analysis on the life of this imam. The way that they would deliver on the life of, for example, the other imams of Ahlul Bayt salam. Sometimes you can go to a lecture on the life of, um, of an imam and somebody picks a topic completely um, unrelated to the life or the biography of yeah, the yeah, imam. Yes, yes. And so I think there has to be a stress that on these nights, even the lecturers have to provide us with a full biography. And of course, one night will never do justice to the biography and the message and the principles of an imam. But sometimes in our communities, that lack of a relationship is because the content that's being delivered does not necessarily inspire you to have that relationship with that imam. Mm. In Muharram, if there is content on Imam al-Hussein, we remain attached to Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam. In the holy month of Ramadan, if there is content by Imam Amir al mumin alayhi salam, then we remain attached. I think there needs to be more lectures out there or more lecturers who focus in their 45 minute to one hour slot on the life of somebody like Imam al-Hadi alayhi salam. So in the following year, there's more of a relationship that's yes, built up. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Sir. Thank you for that. Do you think, Sayyidina, that we have... Uh, a problem in our loyalty to the latter Imams. Because as you mentioned, you know, we remember big nights, but the latter Imams, you know, 10th, 11th Imams specifically, maybe perhaps Imam Jawad al Islam as well, are just not spoken about much. And, you know, there's definite neglect as it were. Yeah, I think uh, all stems from home. If, if the mm. parents highlight the importance of Imam al Hadi, alayhi salam, then the sons and the daughters have that passion for Imam al-Hadi, for Imam al-Jawad, for Imam al-Askar alayhi salam. If the parents are only going to discuss Imam Amir al mumineen and Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam and not mention the other Imams, then from home already there wasn't that much of a relationship with these Imams. Yes. And I think we do have to question on some occasions that there are people who even go to Iraq on Ziyarah and when they go to Iraq on Ziyar, if they're going, for example, to, uh, to Karbala, they'll go to Najaf, they'll go to Kalmain. Um, and there are many who in the times of danger, and there were really dangerous mm. times, mm. especially between 03 and only till recently, True. where it was really difficult when you're going to Samarra, it could be you know, the last day of your life. Yes. There were many out there who had no affiliation, no passion for the... For their, for their imam. You know, Karbala, Najaf seemed a bit safer, we'll go there. And if you told them Samarra, they're like, no, I'm not going to Samarra, it's too dangerous. Uh, so that sometimes does show that, I think while there are many who love that imam, true loyalty is not to leave their shrines alone, mm -hmm. you know, to have that passion to learn more about them. Uh, so I, I do think we do have to reflect on our relationships with the latter imams for sure. Right. Yeah. The, um, the tenth holy Imam, Imam Hadi al Islam, he was born in Saria as well. Uh, could you please inform us more about this place? Um, yeah, this this was an area on the outskirts of uh, of Medina. Okay. Um, Imam al Kalam alayhi salam was the first to have settled there. Right. Um, and you find that he established this mini community for the Ahl al Bayt alayhi salam. And from then onwards, Imam al-Jawad settled there. The Ahl al-Bayt had a, a great reverence and love for the land of Medina. Mm -hmm. Either living within Medina or living on the outskirts of Medina. Okay. So sometimes you may find that there are Imams of Ahl al-Bayt who may be born in the area of Abwa. Okay. There are others who are born in this area, Saria. So these are areas where the Ahl al-Bayt inhabited. And this was an area which originated with Imam al-Kadhim, yes. Okay, and in terms of uh, his mother, from my understanding, she was from Maghrib or perhaps modern-day Morocco. Mm. And I'm curious to find out that uh, the Imams seem to have married uh, from many African circles. Why is this so? Yeah, his, his, his mother was called Saman al-Maghrabiyya. Okay. Okay. Um, 
a pious lady, uh, great dignity, great morals. And you're absolutely right. It continued a trend where the imams had begun to marry women who, as you said, were of African origin. Now, we, there's a disclaimer that whenever you're, you're discussing uh, geography right. in relation to the imams of Ahlul Bayt and the traditions, the geography of then is not necessarily the same as the geography of now. Yeah. But still, there was, there was a contingent, a community, there was a contingent that had come from Africa. And Imam al-Sadiq seems to be the first to have uh, married a lady from Africa with uh, Hamid al-Barbariya. Okay. Um, and they're marrying from Africa for a number of reasons. I think the main reason is to try and break the racism that exists. There are other reasons that, you know, you... You can gain from each other's cultures, for example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you can gain from the African culture. They can gain from your culture. You can break any issues, you know, or any grievances or any sensitivities that may exist between the people who live there because now you're intermarried. Yeah. That's, another, that's another area which one should examine. But I think, generally speaking, when you're looking at these marriages, the aim was to try and remove that racism that may have existed. Right. Uh, there were still Arabs who had uh, a racist attitude. Mm -hmm. uh, there were Arabs who still exist until today, who will blatantly say to you that my son will only marry a girl from my city or from my village, uh, forget marrying from outside, or that my daughter will only marry someone who's of the same skin complexion. Right. And that, for example, if somebody who's a revert now, who comes from a, let's say, a white American background or a black, you know, let's say West Indian uh, or Caribbean background or of African American origin, you find many of them sadly had to go through hardships when it came to, to this particular area. Whereas had our communities reflected on the mothers of the Imams or the wives of the Imams, and the wife of Imam al-Hadi, Salil, Okay. She's of that West African origin. Right. The mother, Somana, is of West African origin. And I really, I'd ask the viewers, all of them who are watching the show, if somebody now, you, say you're from an Indo-Pak background, uh -huh. or you're from an Iraqi background, and somebody came and proposed, for example, for your daughter. Mm -hmm. um, and I've seen this happen in my, in my own career, where you phone a family and you say to them, listen, we, I'd, I'd like to come to your house, if you don't mind, I'd like to carry a proposal now when you're carrying that proposal you're carrying it in the hope that this family is going to be welcoming and appreciative and they are they're like please come home and when you get there everybody is sitting there waiting for you and they're ready to be very hospitable as usual and then they're like where's the proposal from and at that moment you are like well the brother is of african origin yes i'm telling you the look and the yeah and it, the, the, the change of color on these people's faces, it's as if they're telling you, listen, get out of our house as soon true, as possible. True. It seems that that racial element does still exist. Yeah, yeah. And if you're looking at, you know, if you're looking at early Islam, you'll find that existed amongst the Arabs. Uh, I remember when Bilal went up to give adhan, mm. you had some of the hypocrites who were living in Medina who would say things like, there's Muhammad's black crow reciting. Then you had, for example, I'm, the incident of Juwaybar with Ziyad, when Juwaybar wanted to propose for Ziyad's daughter, and, and, and Ziyad, who was one of these huge figures in the, in the Ansar history, was thinking to himself, you know, how can I give my daughter away to, a, to somebody of that complexion? Right. So it seems that Imam al-Sadiq in marrying Hamid al-Barbariya, or you're looking at the other ladies such as Tuktam, Somana, Salil, others. These are all ladies who are of African origin where the Imams are breaking that stereotype that was existing and also that arrogance. True. Yes. Sometimes when somebody comes to propose for our daughter and that person is a mu'min who has sacrificed their time, their wealth, their lives, to come towards the path of Ahl al-Bayt we will only reject that person because of skin color. Yeah. And Imam al-Hadi his skin was known, his complexion was darker right. than the other Imams. His okay. father Imam al-Jawad, some people doubted his Imam because of his dark skin. Yes. 
there were certain people who rejected the Imam of Imam Al Jawad and Imam Al Hadi والسلام, simply because of their skin color. Yeah. And that's sad because yes. the Quran in many verses tried to destroy racism, mm -hmm. tried to make sure that that disease, if you think hypocrisy is a disease, anger is a disease, envy is a disease, racism is one of the diseases you cannot go to a pharmacy for a prescription. May Allah save the person who looks sure. down at somebody because of their skin color. True. When you're looking at how many people in history and until today, until today, you go to Italian football, go to Spanish football, go to football in certain parts of Eastern Europe. Yeah. The racism is phenomenal. You look at our culture sometimes and you find that when we're talking about somebody of a black complexion where we say Abid. Okay. In our head, the mindset that's being created is that this person is a servant to us. He's a slave to us. They've been slaves for so many years. There are some who show racism towards people of Sri Lankan backgrounds or Philippine backgrounds yes, yes. because they see them as slaves to them. Hmm. There are Arabs in Saudi Arabia, for example. You go there on Hajj or Umrah and you see the racism towards Pakistanis and yes. Bengalis. Yes, yes, yes. So when a person asks the question, why do the Imams of Ahlul Bayt السلام, marry ladies from outside of their culture, from a different complexion? It's because the Imams of Ahlul Bayt wanted us to recognize that color of skin should never be a criteria for you to discriminate. Yes. There are certain countries in the world, only 30, 40 years ago, they stopped having restaurants where you had a, a colored area yeah, and a yeah, white yeah. area. That's right. And those countries were meant to be the countries which are the most developed. Most developed. Yeah. Islam yeah. from the very beginning, the family of the Prophet tried to set these principles. Yes, yes. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, so just related to that, do you also think that... Uh, we have racial, issue, racial issues in our mosques as well. Uh, yes, in our mosques for sure. I think, I think you've got resident alims okay. or the resident maulana. You know, every mosque has their maulana. Yeah, yeah. I think that there are maulanas who have been rejected jobs because of skin color. I, I think so too. No, actually, I shouldn't say I think. I know right. that there are maulanas who have been rejected jobs because of what? Because of their skin color. They can speak Arabic. Mm fluently but because the person is black they do not let him lead the community they'll bring somebody else who can't speak english but because he speaks arabic he'll cater for the arab community but hold on we're living in london yeah yeah or you're living in Quite the right. us or you're living in canada or you're living in australia you're bringing me a maulana who's good for your cousins in the village where you're from i can appreciate if he was in a village in Iraq, if he was part of your uncle's best friend circle in a village in Lebanon, mm -hmm. I can appreciate that. But when you're choosing a Maulana for our youth in London, in America, in Canada, in Australia, then the Maulana you want to choose has to be somebody who can relate to them. I don't care about that Maulana's skin color. But there are Maulanas who have been rejected from resident island positions fully qualified mm. because of their skin color. Not to say that there aren't examples True. which we should look at yes. where people did not care about skin color and having the Maulana. You look, for example, and I, I, will, I will name. There are Maulanas who are not of the, not of the cultural communal background, of the mosque where they are an imam, mm -hmm. but that community broke the shackles of racism. Yes, yes, yes. And said we will employ. For example, you find Sheikh Abdul Jalil, resident alim of Idara Jafariya, mm -hmm. Ghanaian background, mainly Indo Pak community, True. but they did not look at the color. They said that this person is somebody with ilm, with taqwa, God conscious, mm -hmm. with knowledge, so they brought him in. You find, for example, Sheikh Noor yes. in Birmingham. The Birmingham Jama'ah did not turn around and say, well, Sheikh Noor is of Ghanaian descent. No, they employed him. You look, for example, in Nairobi, yes. resident alim. You find the community may be a Khoja Jama'ah, but they did not care that the resident alim is somebody who may be of, for example, a different race to them. 
You look, for example, Sheikh Ayyub yes. in the Muslim community of, of East London, of Essex. True. The community did not say, well, that person is of East African descent mm -hmm. as he hails from Arusha in East Africa. I, I'm just giving these examples True. just to show yes, yes. that there are communities and we yeah. are progressing. progressing. We are there evolving. But it's, but it's sad. It's sad those who have been rejected positions because of a cultural, racial arrogance mm. that existed. Alhamdulillah. Yes. Thank you for that. Um, so... Turning to Imam Ali Naqi al Islam, also known as Imam Al Hadi al Islam, he is named Ali, um, the fourth Ali of the twelve. Uh, why were Ahlul Bayt and Islam so adamant, as it were, in, on naming Ali so often? Name me, name me, uh -huh. from the time of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family, until the fall of the Ottoman Caliphate. Name me how many Khulafa were called Ali. I defy anyone. Go on Google. Go on Wikipedia. Type list of Muslim caliphs. I defy anybody to find me in this 1000 years of this glorious History. religion mm. called Islam. Where they say that the glorious caliphate ended in 1920s, the Ottoman okay, caliphate. Yeah. So we had, we had the first four caliphs. We had the Umayyads. We had the Abbasids. We had the Fatimids. We had the Boyids. We had the Seljuks. Mm -hmm. We had empire after empire, Ottomans, and we had Safavids, and we had all of these. I defy people out there. Name me how many were called Ali. No person in history have people tried to remove his legacy and memory like Ali son of Abu Talib. Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam, the number of times in history people tried to delete his name is why the Ahl al-Bayt kept on naming Ali. Imam Ali ibn al-Husayn zan al-Abideen. Imam Ali ibn Musa al-Riyadha. Imam Ali al-Hadi. It's no coincidence that the Ahlul Bayt keep naming Ali. It's no coincidence. The reason they keep naming Ali is because they want to ensure while you're trying to delete his name, we'll keep naming our sons Ali. Yes. Look at Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam. He names his son Ali, Ali. al-Akbar, Ali al-Azhar, Ali Zayn al-Abideen. If I had a thousand sons, I'll name them Ali. Ali. So, Muhammad, when, when you're asking me why they they don't just name Ali. They also add the kunya. Abel Hassan. Mm. In hadith literature, we have Abel Hassan the first, Abel Hassan the second, Abel Hassan the third. They love to remind everybody of Abel Hassan Ali. And that should be taken on board by our own communities. Masha Allah, masha Allah. If you have a son, and that greatest of all boxers said, I'll combine Muhammad and Ali. And I'll put that name together. Those two names are special names. Subhanallah, yeah. subhanallah. Thank you, Sayyidina. Um, so, the tenth holy Imam, if you can perhaps um, just pops, perhaps you know, just enlighten us with his early years of life, as it were, his reference, you know. Well, his dad. Uh -huh. His dad is seventeen when Imam Al Hadi is born. Seventeen. Seventeen. Imam al-Jawad al was 17 when Imam al-Hadi was born. And it wasn't the easiest of times, those eight years he spent with his dad. Because Imam al-Hadi became Imam when he was eight. Right, yes. And he lost his dad at, when he was eight years of age. And those early years were not easy. Uh, the Shia were facing a lot of difficulties. Mm. Uh, trying to get through to Imam al-Jawad. Even though Imam al-Jawad was in Baghdad. Imagine when we get to Samarra, that becomes even more difficult for people to get to the Imam of their time. Uh, but the Shia were facing difficulties. I remember even it reached a stage where Imam al-Jawad makes a plea to the wealthy members of the Shia community to try and contribute more khums okay. in terms of the arbah of the makasib because he wants to because in terms of the you know the the profits that they have made from their businesses try and contribute a bit more 
um, after the expenses because the Shia are going through immense difficulty. And for some of the less wealthy of the Shia, even some were exempt from paying the full khums amount. Right. Because a lot of the Shia were facing severe oppression. The Abbasids were no way going to help the Shia with any... Um, you know, any of the Sadat, especially with any spoils of war, or not going to give anything towards the Imams. So that early period, you know, wasn't easy for them. You've got Imam al-Jawan in Baghdad, Imam al-Hadi in many cases in Medina, mm -hmm. you know, not necessarily being able to be alongside his father. And that, that was now a pattern because Imam al-Rada, when he was in, in, in Khurasan, Imam al-Jawad was not with him. Imam al-Jawad, when he was in Baghdad, Imam al-Hadi was not necessarily with him. Right. Those early years were not very easy at all. Okay. That didn't stop or didn't make Imam al-Hadi rest on his laurels, by the way. Imam al-Hadi would work. You know, one thing people don't know, the Imams of Ahlul Bayt would find it an honor to earn a living. Living, yes, people a person, forget that. Yeah, a person yeah. said that I saw Imam al-Hadi pl planting in the fields. So I came to the Imam and I said to him, Oh, Imam, you're planting in the fields. Let us do this work for you. And he said, my great grandfathers used to do the same. 70 levels of worship. The highest is to earn a lawful living. So Imam al-Hadi, while it was difficult in those early years, yeah. didn't give in and turn around and say, well, you know what? These are trials and I don't want to go out of my house and life is all against me. No, not at all. He tried to communicate with the Shia in Medina. He tried his hardest to represent his father, mm -hmm. but the pressure got too much until eventually they assassinated his father. Okay, yeah. so just along those lines, the pressure, as, you, uh, as you've just mentioned, um, in his early years of Imamat, mm. the blessed Imam, what sort of scrutiny did he face? Was it very similar to his father? Mam Jawad al-Islam? No, I, I don't think it was, it was, I don't think the scrutiny was as intense. I think in the early years of the life of Imam al-Hadi, the caliphs that were in power were still the caliphs on what I call the Ma'moon school of thought. Okay, okay. And there was more of a Mu'tazali current mm -hmm. theologically. Right, yes, yes. So I don't think it was as intense. It was still intense, don't mm. get me wrong. Mm. You know, you're not going to, just let the Imam of Ahlul Bayt be able to preach and teach as he would like. Yes. Um, but I don't think it was as intense. There were there were many debates which were happening, you know, in that period of Al Ma'mun, Imam Al Rada, and then after Al Ma'mun, the caliphs that came in. There's this whole debate about whether the Quran is eternal or the Quran yes, is yes, created. Yes. There's a period of an inquisition of certain scholars, but I don't think. It was as intense. I think when Mutawakkil al Abbasi assumes power, mm -hmm. that's when you have a tyrant in full force. Okay, we'll yeah. come to uh, Mutawakkil uh, um, further along in the show. Um, but uh, so, as the young Imam now, so let's just take everyone on a journey. As the young Imam now, um, was it very hard for him leaving or migrating, as it were, from Medina to Samara? And, and who instig what instigated this move? Ahl al Bayt never, uh, never enjoyed leaving Medina. Right. You know, it was the worst moment for them. Even if you look at Karbala, did they want to leave Medina? Mm -hmm. no. Nobody wanted no. to leave Medina. Sayyidah Zainab alayhi salam's softness of heart was because her grandfather, grandfather. was on one side and her mom's on the other. Yeah. And her brother's on the other. Ahl al Bayt never wanted to leave Medina. But the Abbasids moved their capital. The Abbasids moved their capital from Baghdad okay. to Samarra. Samar. There are different reasons that have been posited as to why. Okay. Some said that there was a Turkish threat within, within mm -hmm. the empire and they needed to ensure um, strategically that they were in a better position. You know, strategically, Samarra would be a better location than Baghdad for you to counter any, any threats. Okay. There are a number of other opinions which we can go into. Suffice for us to, mm -hmm. to state that Samarra, when you break the word Samarra into three, it means that which is pleasing to one's eye. Now, you know, Muhammad, you've been Samarra, I'm in yes, Samarra. Samarra is absolutely beautiful. Beautiful. Uh, Samarra on a, on, on a good day, you know, you see the river flowing, you see the lush green. Um, God save you if it's a bad day. You know, if it's a storm in Samarra, you, you've got it coming. But it. when it's a good day, Samarra is one of the most beautiful places to go and visit. Um, and so the Abbasids decide that, you know what, it's a great place to, 
to have your your soldiers mm -hmm. you know we call we call the son of imam al-hadi imam al -Askari. askari you know the, this is uh this is an army base you know it's a, it's a place where you can settle the soldiers of the army you can counter mm. threats as well yes yes um and Imam al Hadi at the beginning is in Medina. They move to Samarra, they move their capital. But then you've got Al Mutawakil Abbasi has his governor in Medina begin to tell him that, look, if you let Ali al Hadi, uh -huh. like any of his forefathers, if you let them stay in a certain area and you're not keeping an eye on them, they're going to cause you a headache. They're going to cause you trouble. Interesting, around that time, the books like Sahih al-Bukhari and Sahih Muslim are written. Okay, okay. And they're narrating hadiths. There will be 12 after me. There's clearly knowledge. Because mm. uh, many times people say, well, you know, when people say to us, you believe in 12 imams. It's, well, we believe in 12, but there's a mention of the 12 in, in these, you know, in these books such as, you know, uh, Sahih Muslim and Sahih al-Bukhari, 12 emirs, 12 khalifas, 12... Naqibs and mm -hmm. so on are mentioned. Uh, of course, people will give different names, and that's up to them theologically true, who true. they who they decide that they want to put in terms of, of that list. But what you have is that Imam is known as the tenth of the Rawafid. Um, uh, Al Qasim bin Ibrahim al Rasi, mm -hmm. who's one of the Imams of the Zaydiya. Okay. Uh, Zaydi is one of the Shia, offshoots, yeah, offshoots of the Shia madhab. You have the Zaydi, you have the Ismailis, yeah, you yeah, have the Ismailis. Before, before the Ismailis, early. School, yeah, thought. because they go towards Zayd, the son of Imam Zayd yeah. al-Abidin, and the Ismailis go to Ismail, son of Imam al-Sadiq, alayhi salam. So you've got the, the Zaydi have, have a strong presence in that period. And um, the, the Imams are mentioning that Imam al-Hadi is the 10th Imam of the Rawafid. Right. So two things are very interesting here. Imam al-Hadi alayhi salam is seen as the 10th. Yes. There are many who say that your Ithna Ashari uh, belief was something done uh, you know, years after the Imams lived. But here we have you know, concurrent with, with the life mm -hmm. of, of the Imam is the person who's admitting that this person is viewed as the 10th. Tenth. And then you have a title, the Rawafid, the rejectors. Okay, those who reject. Um, the position of the early caliphate yep, yep. and the caliphs who assumed power. <laughs> so there is th that belief there. So the governor um, tells Mutawakil Abbasi that don't leave Ali al-Hadi here. Now, since Karbala, none of the imams politically wanted to raise any army against any caliph. But you would find that their enemies would always suspect that the support that they have means that at any second you could revolt. Yes. You know, sometimes some uh, governments will not allow, for example, certain demonstrations because if that many people turn up at that square on that day, then the whole government can fall. So the Abbasids weren't taking no half measures. They wanted to make sure that the Imam was, you know, pretty close where they could keep an eye. And so the Imam had to leave Medina. Right. And he had to leave Medina with his family. Mm -hmm. It was a very difficult time for them. You know, today you may find somebody leaving Medina to go to Iraq. You might take a flight. You might, you know, those days not easy. Yeah. And Al Mutawakkil Abbasi made sure that this was going to be an arduous journey and a humiliating one as well. Right. So you've, you've mentioned the, um, the key character there, Sayyidina so Mutawakkil Al Abbasi. He's viewed as one of the worst, um, you know, Abbasid Khalifs, as it were. Is this agreed in all schools? No. If not, why not? What, what, what do you, the, what, what do the... Yazid, yeah. Yazid, son of Muawiyah, there are people who defend him. Hmm. So who's Mutawakkil Abbasi? Yazid, son of Muawiyah. There are those out there who defend him. There are those out there who try to put Radiallah and next to Yazid's name. Yes. You know, so if Yazid is somebody who could be defended by certain people, may Allah guide them, then Mutawakkil Abbasi, I'm not surprised when there is a, a, a particular scholar who says Mutawakkil al Abbasi, Muhi Sunnah, wa Mumit al Bid'ah. He's the one who revives the Sunnah of Rasulullah. 
sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. And he's the one who killed all innovations and made sure that they did not come to light. Somebody who treats the great grandson of the Prophet, peace be upon him, his family, in a humiliating manner. Somebody who destroyed the shrine of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. How could you say this? But nothing surprises me anymore, believe you me. Yeah. yeah. The moment I saw a video where somebody said, you know, Yazid didn't really kill Imam al Hussein because he was in Sham. And Imam Hussein died in Karbala. So you can't blame Yazid. That's when I gave up on our history. Yes. Yeah. Uh, viewers, uh, we're just going to be going for a short break. So we've got about three or four minutes. So do um, call in to pose your questions. Uh, the telephone number is 0203 515 Imam Hussein TV would greatly appreciate your donations as well. So you should hopefully see the PayPal ticker tape at the bottom of the screen as well. You can also WhatsApp your questions, telephone numbers. 07939-917163. So now we've just got a couple of questions, so perhaps we'll revisit um, this question that I'm going to put forward now after the break. Um, so you've mentioned about the cruelty, as it were, of Mutawakil al-Abbasi. Um, what measures did Mutawakil take to humiliate the Imam, starting with Khan al-Saliq, if I pronounce Well, let's, it. let's, I think... We'll answer part of it now. Yes. And so then we'll that. answer after because we have like a few minutes. Mm. Mutawakil Abbasi knew that the Imam was revered. And he knew the Imam was loved. And publicly he did not want to show any humiliation. He wanted to tell everybody, look, I'm going to welcome him in the best of ways. But when the people could not see what he had orchestrated, that's where the humiliation would be. You mentioned Khan al saliq mm. He made sure that when he first was on his way to Samarra and getting closer, he made him stay in the slums. Yeah, put him in the worst of places. Now, nobody could see where the slum was. It wasn't that everybody had... No, people thought, well, Ali al-Hadi has come to Samarra. He must be staying in the nicest place. Not at all. The first thing he did was he made sure that he was placed in the slums. And this cruelty of Al-Mutawakkil, I remember reading a tradition where Al-Mutawakkil put the granddaughters of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, in such difficulties that between 10 of them, they would share one piece of cloth to cover their bodies. Uh, the Abbasids were known for their, for their <sighs> oppression. Sadly, people try to cover up this oppression by saying, well, that's the golden age of Islam and we have to, you know, we have to respect all of these. No, not at all. You know, the, the first humiliation and it was a sign of things to come. You're going to come here to Samarra. Not only am I going to keep you under house arrest, not only will I humiliate you, but I'm going to ensure that your patience is tested in every possible way. And inshallah, after the break, we're going to look at other instances where he sought to humiliate Imam al-Hadi, but the beauty of the dignity of Imam al-Hadi in, in response. Inshallah, yeah. inshallah. So viewers, we will be going for a short break in the next moment or two. But as I said, do call in to put your questions forward to Dr. Sayyid Amar Nakshwani. As I said, the telephone number for questions is 0203 515 You can also WhatsApp your questions on 07939-917-163. We'll be right back in the next two minutes, inshallah. Asalaamu Alaikum. Asalaamu Alaikum and welcome back on Imam Hussain TV where we're looking at the life of Imam Hadi al-Islam, also referred to as Imam Ali Naqi al-Islam. Sayyidina, just, um, just before the break, um, you were enlightening the viewers and myself on um, the measures, unfortunately, the cruel measures that Mutawakkil al-Abbasi um, was um, taking out, as it were, and then we just uh, 
started to touch on Khan al Salik. So if you can just um, perhaps... Yeah, so as I was saying, and what's very interesting mm. is that every Imam of Ahlul Bayt السلام, faces a trial or tribulation mm. one way or the mm. other. I think, you know, the, these are very difficult times for Imam Al Hadi alayhi salam. He, you know, he, he's, he's still very young, you know, when his father dies and this person now is, you know, at what age? They're, they're in an age where many of us would find, you know, such pressure extremely difficult. Um, and the second policy of Al-Mutawakkil and other Abbas at Khulafa, always with his father, Imam Al-Jawad, was to try and disprove their greatness by bringing the greatest scholar of their particular time. So, you know, what you do is okay. you get this really prominent scholar and you're like, this Ali Al-Hadi is not all that he, you know, right. is made out to be. Right. We can easily, um, you know, debate him right now. And, uh -huh. and this interesting figure re-emerges who emerged... With Imam Al Jawad alayhi salam. If you remember when we did our show on Imam Al Jawad, when Imam Al Jawad alayhi salam at the age of nine became Imam, and mm -hmm. everybody's like, how could a nine year old be an Imam? And there was that one person by the name of Yahya, son of Akhtham. Yes, yes, yes. Now, Yahya bin Akhtham, he, he, asks, uh, he asks Imam Al Jawad a famous question, and that was, what's the kafara for someone who hunts while in the state of Ihram? Mm -hmm. And you remember Imam Al Jawad says to him, it's a very vague question and Yahya is like, what do you mean? He's like, well, ihram for hajj or ihram for umrah? umrah. Was it in the daytime or was it in the right. night? Was it in Mecca or outside of Mecca? Was it an, a, a normal animal or a wild animal? Subhanallah. You know, so he began to ask all these. Now, this Yahya bin Akhtham, interestingly, is asked to reappear okay. again now to question Imam al-Hadi alayhi salam. And not just Yahya bin Akhtham, you had Ibn Sikit, mm -hmm. you had Ibn Junaid, you had you know, Yahya bin Akhtham. All of these uh, scholars were asked to question Imam Al-Hadi alayhi salam. And the aim was to humiliate the Imam. I remember even on that note, if you look at Surah 25 verse 27. Okay. Um, I'm sure you've read the verse. On, on that day, the oppressor will bite their hands. Yes, saying, yes, I yes. wish I had taken the Prophet as my partner. Aha, aha, yes. um, and not taken somebody else mm. who has misguided me. And, uh, and Al-Mutawakkil tries to humiliate the Imam because he hears that the Imam has mentioned who those two are, who on the day of judgment will say that we wish we hadn't taken each other as partners for the zulm that we had done to Ahlul yeah, Bayt. Yes. And everybody knows who those two are. Mm. Now he tries to humiliate the Imam by saying what? He tries to humiliate the Imam by saying that we heard that you mentioned the names or implied the names of two in Islamic history who on the day of judgment, when the ayah says, uh -huh, uh -huh. that day that the zalim will bite their hands, right. you implied who they were. So Imam al Jawad, uh, Imam al Hadi would very beautifully look at him and say, Why would I mention the names when Allah has decided not to mention them in the verse? You know, it's a, it's a very nice reply. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that verse says that somebody on the day of judgment will say that I wish I had not taken this partner. I wish I had taken the Prophet's path. Mm, preserving the dignity. But Allah did not mention the name. Now, other, the, of these other scholars, Al-Mutawakkil would use, you know, so you've got Ibn Sikit, you've got Ibn Junaid, you've got Yahya bin Akhtar. So they come, one of them comes to the Imam Al-Hadi uh, and he says to him, he says, I want to ask you a question. Now there's a big crowd gathered. The aim is to humiliate Imam Al-Hadi alayhi salam. Imam with all calmness, with all coolness. Mm. The person looks at him and he says, Ali, son of Abu Talib's behavior at Jamal was different to his behavior at Safin. At Jamal, with those who ran away, Ali said, leave them, let them run. But with, in Safin, he told his soldiers, capture those who run away. Okay. If he was right at Jamal, Will you admit that he was wrong at Safin? Because you say that your Imams, their decisions will be the same. So why is it that at Jamal, Imam Ali alayhi salam says, those who are running away, leave them. Whereas at Safin, Imam Ali alayhi salam says what? He says, those who are running away, capture them. Imam al-Hadi replied with such composure, 
What did Imam al-Hadi alayhi salam say? Imam al-Hadi said that Amir al-Mu'mineen's decision at Jamal was different to Safin for one reason. At Jamal, there was no leader. So these people did not have a central person guiding them or directing them at the end of that battle. It became haphazard. Talha died. Zubair died. Mm. Aisha and the camel and so on has fallen. There was no let them people go. Whereas at Safin, Muawiyah was still directing them. Therefore, you had to capture them because there was a central figure who was directing all of their actions. So when that person tried to humiliate the Imam, the Imam replied, very listen. You want knowledge? You come to Ahl al-Bayt There was another person who came in front of everybody. He said, you claim to be a man of knowledge. I want to ask you a question. Why Moses' miracle was magic? Why Jesus' miracle was medicine? Medicine, yeah. Healing. Why Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, why his miracle was Literature and so on, so on. the Quran? Mm. And he replied, Nabi Musa alayhi salam, because in his time, the magicians were in such a prominent position. They used to have a stick with mercury inside it. And they would put it in front of the heat of the sun so it looked like that the stick was moving. Like a snake. snake. So Allah gave Musa the miracle of a stick that became a snake. snake. So those magicians automatically knowing their trade came towards the path of Allah. In Jesus' time, nobody would cure the leper. Mm. Nobody would sit with the leper. The lepers were a neglected community. Nobody could raise the dead and make them alive until today. Nobody was able to cure the blind. The physicians were at a strong level but couldn't do these things. A prophet of Allah was giving those miracles. In the time of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa peace be upon him his family, the Arabians, they knew their language inside out. They knew their literature, their grammar. Yes. They knew yes. the structure of their sentences and verses. They pr were proud of their poetry. Poetry. Until Walid ibn al mughira says, In hadha illa sihrun yu'thar. These are just the words of a magician. magician. I don't mind because magic is that which is extraordinary. You've admitted that these are not the words of a normal human being. Yes, yes, quite. So true. the Imam would always entertain. Look, if you have any questions to ask, feel free to ask. So that was a second method of humiliation. But I think with the wine incident, mm -hmm. that probably was the most difficult moment for the imam okay okay fine so we'll go to this incident and then we'll go quickly on to a couple of questions um say now um so mutawakil he broke into the holy imam's house and he broke in at night in the middle of the night and he was drunk so what exactly happened what it would be normal for him to just smash the door of the imam yeah. down and walk into his house we had already seen a house door broken in Medina years before. Yes, yes. And it was normal. It was normal for... Mutawakkil used to be intoxicated. And many Muslim Khalifas were drunkards. Mm -hmm. But we shouldn't say these things, you know. It's, you have to try and be uh, politically correct. But anyone who studies the Umayyads and the Abbasids, some of them even had pools made of alcohol. You know, Yazid and people like this and... You know, the likes of Mutawakkil al-Abbasi. These were known drunkards. And if they've had one drink too many, God save you. And only Allah knows what sabr, what patience. Imam al-Hadi had, where in the middle of the night, Mutawakkil barges into his house with a glass of champagne, glass of alcohol. Imam is sitting down. And he puts it next to the Imam. The Imam said, we... This never mixes with our flesh or our blood. I think there's a huge lesson there because there's a lot of us who, for the sake of the odd pound or the odd dollar, won't tell anybody to remove their glass of wine this, or alcohol yeah. at that business meeting. And, and some people, because they, some people, because they rejected such meetings, lost jobs, but I think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you in other ways. Yes, yes. Then there are others who, mashallah, they made a lot of good money. And, and, and it's interesting, those who make a lot of good money, where they've sat on you know, tables where there's a lot of alcohol and so on, 
They've got their ways of justifying. Mm. You know, they'll give a big donation to some mosque somewhere. They probably don't care about the place, but they're just like, listen, I've done a bit of haram this year and I'm, I'm going to need to expiate it. <clears throat> and then there may be others who may sell even uh, alcohol and find ways of donating to some war-torn Muslim country to make up for this. But what you have is that um, he places the, the glass of wine um, and... Imam says, our flesh and, our flesh and blood, blood never mixes mix. with such things. And then with his drunkard way, reminding me of the governor of Kufa, Walid bin Uqba, when he was drunk leading Salat al-Fajr in the time of Uthman. When he was drunk, he, he then turned to the Imam, he said to him, recite poetry for me. And the Imam said, it's not common for us to recite poetry, but I will. He begins to recite these lines of poetry, which I recommend anyone to go and study. Because they're lessons for all of us in lives. In our lives, they're a lesson for all of us today. Because he's saying, where are those people who sit in those government positions? Protected by powerful people around them but they will never reach a stage where they are needless. There will be a day they will go to their graves and they will hear a call. Where are those luxury houses and clothes? Where are all those luxury gifts that you have? And really, in those lines of poetry, I only paraphrased a few of them, but in those lines of poetry... The Imam wanted to tell Mutawakkil, Mutawakkil, you could sit here in Samarra, all powerful, mm -hmm. acting arrogant with me. Firstly, the fact that you're out wandering the streets and barging into my house shows you are not needless. There's something missing. You know, there are people who go clubbing. Yeah. And when they go clubbing, some people go clubbing because they want to have a good night out in their, in their relative morality. They believe that that's a good night out. There are others drown. Literally, the phrase is to drown, drown. one's sorrows. Yeah, yeah, unfortunately. Now, what do we mean drown one's sorrows? It's difficult when you have everything, but you don't have peace. There are many out there who have a nice car. They have a nice house. They got a good job. Still no peace. They don't know, okay, I was in the womb of my mother. I didn't know what world it was. Then I came to this world. What is there to suggest that this is the last world? Where am I going? Where am I heading? It tells Mutawakkil, you're sitting in, in a strong position with your government. You can't relax unless you've got powerful soldiers around you. Because you know the Turkish soldiers are about to assassinate you. And ironically, it's his son who assassinates him. Right. And then he says to him, Mutawakkil, even if you are powerful, when you go to that grave and you're asked the questions about what you have, what are you going to answer? Mm. We're all powerful now until we're in that six, grave. Yeah, six feet under. And then. Yeah, oh, sometimes, you know, you read the eye in the Quran. It's, it's got a number of different ways of looking at it. But one way, Al Hakum al Takathar, Hatta Zortum al Maqabar. Kella sofa ta'lamu. Thumma kella sofa. Truly, <clears throat> you go to that grave, you will come to know. Sure. You know, some of the soldiers of Mutawakkil, when Imam al-Hadi did this, some of them were shaken because they're thinking, Mutawakkil is drunk. He's just going to pick up a sword and slash Imam al-Hadi. He's begun to cry. And I don't care how powerful you are in this world. <coughs> You'll always find that there are moments you just sit there and cry because you're not sure why you have no happiness. He just walked away crying. And Imam al-Hadi told his companions, you see that man's arrogance? He's going to die shortly. A few days he died. Yeah. Right, okay. Uh, we'll come to the point about migration and the trials of migration. But just before we do um, say now, we'll just take a few questions via WhatsApp. And please feel free to, I think these will probably be covered in the show today anyway. So I'll just go uh, very quickly. How was um, Imam Hadi martyred? Yeah, Salam that's coming at the end of the show. Yeah. Yeah. Alaikum. Uh, what was Imam? Ha what was Imam Hadi's pioneering attributes that helped change the human consciousness 
Yeah, era. we're coming to this. And what is the most reliable book on the life of Imam Ali Naqi al-Islam, Imam Hadi? Sure, in terms of books on Imam al Hadi's life, I would say Kitab al-Arshad of Sheikh al-Mufid has a great Mufid. chapter on Imam al Hadi, uh, translated by the late IKA Howard. Uh -huh. Sharif Baqar Qarashi has has that whole, um, I think, the life of all, the 14 Mahsumin. Uh, published by Ansari, Ansari Publications. Yes, um, yes. Yeah, I think I think that's a great work to read on Imam Al Hadi Salam's life as well. Okay, okay. Thank you, Shukun, for that. Um, so, the um, what lessons are there that we Muslims can learn, as it were, from the trials of migration and harassment? Yeah, I, I think there are many Muslims who, when looking at the life of the Prophet or the Imams. There's always this thing of, well, they lived a thousand years ago, mm, or they are yeah, different yeah. to us, or Stress. they are ma'soom. Buddy, migration is migration. This imam had to leave his home to migrate. That's a lesson for all of us that, look, if you do have to pack up and leave, there are greater people before you who did. Yes. Don't complain. Because there are people who are like, you know, I was living here, then I was moved there, then I moved here. Listen, the Prophet moved from Mecca to Medina. Imam Ali moved from Medina to Kufa. Imam al radha moved from Medina to Khurasan. Yes. Imam Al-Hadi moved from Medina to Samarra. Samar. And in terms of trials and tribulations, anyone who goes through a hard time, nobody went through harder times than the Imams and their Shia. Okay. And I think these are two wonderful lessons from Imam Al-Hadi. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so there's uh, quite a few main points now. Um, how did the... Shia community, or how did the Shia structure themselves with an Imam so far from them? Because he was quite far from the followers yeah. of the Ahlul Bayt Well, you're yeah, absolutely right, because already now, if we're in Karbala, it takes yeah. us a few hours to get to, to Samarra, let mm. alone at that time. And the main Shi'i circles at that time, you're looking at Baghdad, you're looking at Hilla, yes, sir. Um, you're looking at Qom, mm -hmm. Ahwaz, uh -huh. uh, Kufa, uh, you know, these are the main Shia areas. And what you have is from the time of Imam al Sadiq, there is already a system that's been um, structured called the Wikala. Okay. You know how you have a Wakil, a representative? Uh -huh, uh -huh. So the Imams had Wakils. Right. And really, when you're looking at some of the lives of, of, the, of the companions of the Imams, they've done a great service to the religion in trying to keep the Shia structure united. The likes of Uthman bin Sa'id, Shah Abdul Azim, mm -hmm. uh, who people visit when they go to, um, you know. And then you've got Ayyub bin Nuh, you know, and other, other great companions of the Imams gave a great service back. Uh, so in Qum, you had quite a strong Shi'i community. Yes. And uh, they had a wakil who'd come and visit the Imam. And you had, for example, in um, Hilla and Baghdad and Kufa and Ahwaz and Basra, there was a wikala underground, Tanzim Sirri, a secret underground movement, who my master supervisor, Dr. Jasim Hussain, wrote a fantastic book, which is available online, okay. called The Occultation of the Twelfth Imam, right. and looks at the structure of the movement underground on how the Shia would even take jobs, uh -huh. such as butter sellers, right. you know, or take jobs in the markets to try and preserve the Shi'i identity at the time. Okay, yeah. okay. So just going on to that point, two yeah. points that I want to raise. So this whole concept of taqiyya, first yeah. of all, and also, and I'm trying to rush through because we've got a lot to cover still. Taqiyya, first of all, and also you've mentioned there were Shia, as it were, in Qom. Yeah. How long were they present there as well? So these two points, if you can just... Shia had been in light. Qom... Uh, for, for a good period actually Because the Ash'ari tribe Which hailed from Yemen You know Abu Musa al-Ash'ari and so on right. there, were, there was um, uh, Members of the Ash'ari tribe Who had moved to, to Qum um, A long time before Imam al-Hadi was there So yeah there was a good Shi'i population in Qum already In terms of Taqiyya yeah. You only employ Taqiyya When you've got animals in power not humans. Mm -hmm. okay. When there's animals, barbaric animals, that's when you need to use taqiyya. Yes. Um, if, if, if the people who are ruling the state or the government are decent human beings willing to entertain a plethora or plurality of opinion, you don't need to be in taqiyya. But when you have uh, animals, then you know, whenever taqiyya is being used, then you know there's always an animal in power. Yeah. Okay. And just very quickly, just onto that same point, 
in terms of transmission of knowledge, as it were, how how was the communication, as it were, between the imam and... Yeah, there are letters. Right, yeah, right, right. Visitations were taking place. Okay. Hajj was an important period. Right. Um, congregations between the Shia. Has always Hajj was an important... Even the Kufans who used to visit Imam al-Sadiq. Uh, Imam al-Sadiq didn't really teach much in Kufa, um, but there were Kufans who'd visit Imam al-Sadiq in the Hajj period. Hajj was an important period. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, yeah. And in terms of his name, Al-Hadi, as it were, uh, as I mentioned, you know, the divine manifestation, as it were, of that name of Allah, the attribute, as it were. There were, did the Shia have war infractions? And as a result of that, how did they, uh, how did they, Holy Imam, guide them? Oh, you had... And that's uh, a key point, really, because... You had some extremists. Yeah. Uh, like in any school in Islam, you've, you've got extremist tendencies. There were people who were extremist Shia who had begun to say that the Imams were God. You know, when we come to Ziyarat al-Jami'ah shortly, yeah, we were very you got to recite Allahu Akbar a hundred times before you recite Ziyarat al-Jami'ah. You know that? Yes. You got to say Allahu Akbar a hundred times. Because if you recite Ziyarat al-Jami'ah without... The correct, correct Adab al akhlaq Exactly. And reciting Allahu Akbar. And there was Shia who were known as ghulat, extremists. Mm, extremists. Now, what the parameters of extremism are, always open to debate. Yes. But there was definitely Shia were extremists. Then there was Shia who tried to enter the debate about the Quran created or eternal. Imam told them, stay out. <coughs> so, in terms of the ghulat, Imam, you know, Imam did la'nat on them. And Imam said, these are not part of our sect. And in terms of the others who were trying to enter debates that were going nowhere, he would tell them, you know what, stay away from these. Don't cause trouble amongst each other. Okay, okay. So now we turn to uh, Ziyad al Jamia. Um, saying us, saying us, enlighten us. Why is it so special? Was it right? Ziyad al Jamia. Ziyad al Jamia. Guys, it's for the real Shia. A real Shia immerses themselves in Ziyad al Jamia. It becomes tattooed all over his mindset. Subhanallah. You want to know why we are so blessed to know Muhammad and Al Muhammad and to have the Imams of Al Muhammad and to be born on the path of the Imams of Al Muhammad? You read Ziyarat al Jami'ah. Absolutely phenomenal Ziyarat. You know, not from the realms of rational theology. This is mystical. This is when Imam al-Hadi tells you, you want to know what we are? We are the family of Allah. Subhanallah. Salams to the family of Allah. Those who hold on to us are those who are successful. And those who leave us are those who have left religion. It was in our wilaya that the message was complete and the blessed became greater. There are some extraordinary lines where literally the Imams are the axis of existence. And really you see that some of the greatest ulama, Saduq, Tusi, Ahsai, Muhammad Taqil Majlisi, amongst others who have just written profoundly on Ziyarat al Jami'ah. I think every line in Ziyarat al Jami'ah of Imam al Hadi, every single line requires a majlis. Yeah. SubhanAllah. Okay. Um, so I'd like to stay on this uh, area of uh, the virtues of Ziyarat for a little while. Um, what are the sources of this Ziyarat? Ziyarat al Jami'ah is. Uh, in the Tahdeeb of Shaykh al Tusi and Man La Yahdarahu al Faqih of Shaykh al Saduq. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And is, has anyone written a tafsir or a shahar or a tafsir on Ziyarat al Jamia? I think, um, I think the, probably the greatest tafsir on Ziyarat al Jamia is Shaykh Ahmed al Ahsai. Okay. You know, mystical tafsir. Really? Ahsai, well, you know, it's, it's going to take you to the mystical realms. But hey, Ziyarat al Jamia is mystical. Mm. Ziyarat al Jamia shows you that those Imams that you follow aren't just Arab men. They belong to a different realm. The secrets of Allah 
are manifested in those 12. Ahsa'i and Muhammad Taqi al Majlisi, probably both have written the Sharh. I think Ahsa'i is in four volumes. Yeah. Subhanallah, Subhanallah. Okay, so now t coming to the point of uh, Ziyara, yeah. as it were, uh, why were there so many different Ziyara, as it were, written by Imams, as it were? I think different reasons. Because they were slightly different. Sure, I think one, one reason you were able to teach the Aqeedah of the Shia through a Ziyara because you never were able to give a class publicly teaching Aqaid. Okay, okay. So if I give you an example, let's look at, you know, Sahih Sajjadiyah. Mm -hmm. Sahih Sajjadiyah, in my opinion, is Imam Zainal Abidin saying, if, I, if you're not allowing me to teach publicly, I'm going to put all the Aqeedah lessons in Dua. Sahih Sajjadiyah is not just Dua. Sahih Sajjadiyah is, you, Bani Umayyah, do not let us give classes. All of our classes will be in du these du'as. Our Shia will know the class and the lesson when they open their heart to that du'a. That's Sahib Sajjadi. I think the Ziyadahs likewise, first reason is because you've got Aqeedah within the Ziyadah. I think second reason is, is quite obvious and that is maintaining Tawalla mm -hmm. and Tabarra. You know, that love and guardianship of the Ahlul Bayt السلام, and dissociating from their enemies. enemies. Because their enemies are the very manifestation of Zulm. Mm. And Ahlul Bayt are the manifestation of Adala. Uh, and thirdly, I think a physical reason. You, you're not able to literally perform ziyara, visitation of the grave, so you could perform it from afar. Okay, okay. Yeah. <clears throat> so. You've uh, quite wonderfully, if I must say, Thank uh, you. given a brilliant uh, description and a breakdown of Ziyara. Um, so now coming to key um, Ziyara, as it were, uh, what is the difference, CG, for example, Ziyad Aminullah, Ziyad Imam Sain, Ziyad Jamia? I think, I think the first two are Ziyaras of specific Imam. Okay. Whereas right. Ziyad Jamia is not specific Imam. It is. Recognition. All of the Imams' positions, Collect status, mm -hmm. attributes. And I know many ulama who have said, our hajat were answered when we read Ziyarat al Jamia. So there are many of our viewers out there who have read Ziyarat al Hussein, salam. Ziyarat Ashura. They have read, for example, other Ziyarat, ziyarat Warith. Read Ziyarat al Jamia. And you know what? You don't even have to read it in the way where you stand up and you're facing and you're just going through Arabic words. Just sit and read the translation of Ziyarat al Jami'ah. And that's why Imam al Hadi is like, You've tried to humiliate me. And you think we're affected. Let me tell you who we are. It's a stunning Ziyarat. SubhanAllah. Yeah. And in your opinion, why, why do you think they're not discussed so much? It's a shame. Because I, I think it's, not, it's, a, it's, it's sad that there are many out there who have never heard of Ziyarat al-Jamia. Yeah. There's many out there who don't know anything about Imam al-Hadi, let alone Ziyarat al-Jamia. Uh, but I think the onus, you see, in this day and age, I always repeat this. We're living at a time where knowledge is easily accessible. You know, our parents used to wait for cassettes yeah, yeah. to come to hear majalis. Some of our parents lost lives listening to majalis. Some people in Iraq had their ears cut off because they were found to listen to Majalis. Today when you have articles available online, you have lectures available online. No excuse. You know, I, I see, it's amazing how many of our youth will sit on their phones and play this Candy Crush and these other games and some gambling games and others might play games which take them nowhere. And listen, I don't want to be a party pooper. Look, I, you know, there's always time to enjoy oneself, but... Imam al-Baqir used to always say the sign of our Shia is their ilm. They're always searching for ilm. They're always seeking to disseminate. I don't think you can only blame speakers and lecturers and maulanas for not having discussed Ziyat al-Jami'ah. Sometimes you yourself have to take some time out of your busy schedule to try and open up the wonderful legacy of Ahl al-Bayt. Okay, okay. Um, the blessed 10th holy Imam, Imam Hadi al-Islam, um, did he have sons? Yeah, Imam al-Hadi had a number of sons. 
the most famous being of course Imam al-Askari alayhi yeah. salam. Um, Sayyid Muhammad buried in Balad, mm. phenomenal personality. Many of us have done the ziyara and for those who haven't, may Allah bless them that Inshallah. they do the ziyara of Sayyid Muhammad in Balad. He's a phenomenal, phenomenal personality. You know, Iraqis will always say that Sayyid Muhammad is loved by them because um, when they can't have children, they ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Allah, in the name Please, of the great position. grandson of the Prophet, peace be upon him, his family by the name of um, Muhammad, um, the son of Imam al-Hadi. And I remember Ayatollah, uh, Ayatollah Najafi Mar'ashi, Mar'ashi Najafi, mm. the one of the special. famous, you know, special, special personality. <coughs> he said that I was on my way to performing the ziyarah of Sayyid Muhammad in Balad when all of a sudden the heat overtook me. He said, the next time I woke up, a man said to me, where were you heading? He said to Sayyid Muhammad in Balad, he goes, you're here. He goes, what do you mean? He goes, you're here, don't worry. He goes, I thought to myself, who is this man? That he was able to talk to me in this way that I'm sure I had fallen away before. And he's carried me to Sayyid Muhammad. How did he know that I was going to Sayyid Muhammad? He said, the man looked at me and said, tell our Shia to memorize the sermon of Shakshaqiya and to know about the sermon of Fadak mm -hmm. and to continuously recite Ziyarat Ashura and to do Salat Al-Layl and to have a ring with the names of the Imams yes. engraved on. He said, I heard him give this advice. I thought, who is he? I turned around, he was not there. He goes, I realized who that was. The grandson of Imam al-Hadi, Imam al-Hujjah, al-Sharif. So, said Muhammad, you have Ja'far, another son of Imam al-Hadi. Right. So there are a number of sons he had. Yeah. Okay, all right. Um, clearly, the holy Imam had a special fervor, as it were, towards uh, the ziyad of Imam Hussein Islam. Just how difficult was it? Just how difficult was it for followers of Imam Hadi al-Islam and lovers of Ahlul Bayt al-Islam to go on ziyarah to specifically the, the shrine of Imam Hussein Islam. Yeah, they, because they, again, they, lots of Shias don't, don't know this. They, they put a 1,000 gold dinar tax only on those who want to visit Karbala, no other place. Imagine now in the UK, they say to you, only those of you who want to go and visit, for example, let's say, those who want to go and visit Liverpool, they say that there is a tax you have to pay. Now, others will say, hold on, why only Liverpool? Why is there not a tax for other areas? No, they said you only Liverpool. There is a tax that has to be paid by all of you. Karbala, 1,000 gold dinar, there was a tax to stop Zawar al Hussein. Then after that, they said, well, those who do go to Karbala and can do that, one out of 10 is to be killed. And yet Imam al Hadi alayhi salam, you know, Imam al-Hadi, there's one thing special about him. I, I will never forget. They told him that there was a dancer that had gone to Karbala. A lady who was a dancer in the court of the Abbasids. And it's as if he tells his followers, don't be judgmental. You know, you don't know what her niyyah is. You don't know what her circumstances are. Sometimes we see people in certain professions. We don't know what, what happened in their life, what circumstances they mm -hmm. are. Don't judge. Because on... It was the 15th of Sha'ban and the Abbas al Khalifa said, where's my dance? And they said to him, she's gone Hajj. He's like, it's Sha'ban. How could you go Hajj? And she, and she comes back and he goes, where were you? She goes, I had just gone for Ziyar. He's like, they told me Hajj, but it's not the time of Hajj. And she replied, no, I'd gone to visit Abu Abdullah. And people had to disguise themselves so that no one would think they'd gone visit Abu Abdullah. So the Ahlul Bayt, for Imam al Hussein, there's a special affiliation. There's actually an area of study which I still want to go into a bit okay. further, and that right. is <clears throat> after Imam al Sadiq, how many Imams managed to visit Abu Abdullah? You know, this hit me only recently because I thought to myself, so Imam Zahamdi has visited Karbala, we all know. Yeah. Imam al-Baqir was at Karbala, we know. Yes. Imam al-Sadiq, some narrate that there is a garden of Imam al-Sadiq uh, on the outskirts of Karbala. Karbala. And, you know, people visit it until today. Yeah. I wonder, Imam al kadhim Imam al radha Imam al jawari Imam al-Hadi, Imam al-Askari, alayhi salam did they visit Karbala? Did the Abbasids give them the freedom? Now, I don't want to go into a, 
a mystical discussion of the imam can go anywhere, you know, all of yeah, these yeah, things. Yeah. I don't want to go yeah. into that. I, I personally, I'm still doing my research on this area about the imams of Ahlul Bayt السلام, after Imam al-Sadiq and whether they got the chance to go to Karbala and maybe that's where that ziyara literature comes. Where you say, I visit my master, Abu Abdullah, from near, from far, on behalf mm. of my parents. Mm. You know, was it only the Shia who were not able to visit? Or maybe the Imams couldn't visit? You know, Imam al-Sadr cries when he speaks to Muawiyah bin Wahab. Forgive me and my brethren and the Zawar of Hussein, those who spent their wealth and put their bodies in danger just to visit him and, and please the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family. So have mercy on the cheeks that rub themselves on the grave of Abu Abdullah. Have mercy on the eyes that shed tears for Abu Abdullah. Have mercy on the heart that breaks for Abu Abdullah. Have mercy on those hearts that are burnt when they remember Masar Hussein. So I think someone has to maybe look at this mm -hmm. as to whether the Imams actually visited Abu Abdullah in that late period or was there too much oppression for them to go? Right, yeah. okay. Um, I think, see now we've just got time for one question. So, um, why was the blessed Imam poisoned? As we know, every Imam has reached the status of Insan and Kamil sure. and can only be Shaheed. That's the only way he can sure. depart from this world. And again, most of the masses don't know that. Um, so that's the first point. And just very lastly, what happened at his funeral because we've got hardly two minutes. Yeah, Mu'taz the Abbas al Khalifa, there was a, a real jealousy of the success of the Imam that under all trials and tribulations maintained his dignity. People of Samarra turned and started to love Imam al Hadi. At the beginning, yes. there wasn't necessarily that much love. By the end, people were slapping themselves in the funeral. I've read hadiths where people were hitting themselves in the funeral of Imam al Hadi. Where even Imam al Asghar was finding it hard to escort his father's body, body because of how many people were trying to jump and surround the body. But as they did with his you know, forefathers, and they, they, they poisoned him, yeah. And, um, and I remember one scholar in his Masa'ib saying that he requested that he is laid on the ground so he feels a bit of what Abu Abdullah felt when he, when he was dying. You know, so there's that real love for Abu Abdullah and all the Imams and especially in Imam Al-Hadi's final moments. And our condolences to his grandson, Imam Sahib as zaman Sahib as yeah. Viewers, we've run out of time and it's been a great pleasure to have Dr. Sayyid Aman Akshwani on our live show tonight. I hope you've enjoyed the show. Um, from Dr. Sayyid Aman Akshwani and myself, Muhammad Ali. See you again next time, inshallah. Asalaamu Alaikum. Mm -hmm.